fabulous school. Music is a tool for activism. Music is a way to move people and heal. Thank you for sharing tonight with me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Eugema. Thank you so much. Stay in touch with me. Peace. Welcome to the Independent Artist Series with your host, Veronda Baker. This week, we're covering Brooklyn. Brooklynite, born and raised Maya Asusena, is a multiple award-winning singer, has been singing and performing since she was four years old. She attended the famous LaGuardia High School, also known as the Fame School. Maya was awarded a Grammy Award certificate for her work on Mind Control, which won Best Reggae Album of the Year with Stephen Marley. Maya is a humanitarian and advocate for social injustice. She has performed at the Save the Four rally along with President Barack Obama and George Clooney. Her work with singer Jaboni, a Croatian superstar, garnered her two porn awards. That is Croatia's top music award, which is the equivalent to the Grammy. Maya Asusena. How are you today? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for sitting down with me and having a conversation about your life and your career. It's I appreciate it. Very absolute much. pleasure. Okay. You're a writer, composer, arranger. Are you originally from Brooklyn? Born and raised. What part of Brooklyn? Flatbush is the name of the area. Lefferts Garden, particularly, if you really narrow it down, but generally speaking, it's considered the Flatbush area of Brooklyn near Prospect Park. No. And then I ended up going to LaGuardia Performing Arts High School in Manhattan. Or how did that happen? Honestly, it started way before, I mean, I was conscious of even being in school. I mean, when I was four, I already was rehearsing songs and presenting them to my parents, like, in a show. And um, I think I did my first play when I was four. So I always knew, I never had a question as to whether or not I'd be an artist. I just didn't, you know, um, it, when I was very, very young, I didn't know that you had to choose, you know, as a, a career path, you know, oh, is it acting or singing? Is it dancing? or, You know, I did all of them, but singing always, always, always. Four years old. Yeah, like serious business. Like I found a report card from when I was seven and the teacher was like, Maya has a great singing voice. But there is some footage from high school. I did an opera in high school. Okay. So tell me about your experience at LaGuardia High School with performers. I know it's performing. So is it singers and musicians only, or is it you, dancing? You actually, it is everything. Like, you have to declare a major, mm -hmm. like, being in the university. And at the time, I thought that music was my weakness. So I decided, well, why don't I study and strengthen my weakness? And I studied opera, and I got really, like, invaluable, you know, technique out of Lear, you know, learning, you know, classical technique. After LaGuardia High School, I went to an extremely high-end small college called Swarthmore. Uh, they have half as many students as my high school did. So imagine coming from Brooklyn, New York, a, a high school that had over 3,000 students to a school that had 1,300 kids and literally less than 20 black kids. It was a great school, though. I felt like I was in, you know, an intellectual environment that challenged me and 
I enjoyed that. I was just about to declare a major of acting and I kind of decided to leave. <laughs> I had left college because I don't know, I was in New York City, I was auditioning for major motion pictures, getting final callbacks for television shows, I was singing with bands, I was already doing that before I went to college. Suddenly I was plucked out of the environment, the entertainment environment in a small town in Pennsylvania, and I was spending money to talk about one day doing what I was already doing. So I thought that the best way for me to be a student of drama and a student of music and learning the industry was to be in the industry as opposed to, you know, being away at a school talking about being in the industry. And, you know, I'm, I'm a type of a person, like, I see myself as a student always. So I didn't look at it as giving up my education, I just looked at it as I felt that I would be better educated by learning the trade, by being in the being in the life. environment, yeah, as opposed to isolating myself and discussing being in the environment. Um, no, I just um, I didn't feel that in my case that a degree was going to put me further along in acting or singing. I felt that practicing my craft was what was going to help me. And uh, so part of the reason I left Swarthmore was to, to, to not lose the momentum that I felt that I was gaining before I left. What was your, would you say it was your first show? Because I know you were gigging No, before, there was a whole lot of time floundering, trust me. Before I had my first gig with my band, as Maya Asustena, as you know, you know me now, um, before that I spent time sort of finding a sound, looking for producers, you know, it took me a minute to even arrive at starting a band. Like before that I was trying to get together with all these different hip hop producers, you know, um, and finding myself really frustrated with a lack of like follow through, you know, I have all these half written songs because you can never get the guy on the phone again, you know, after the first session. and. So, the first gig that I can say, one of the most important first gigs that I had was at SOBs. So it's kind of full circle that you got to shoot my concert at SOBs. That was really, I think, the first real stage where I introduced the Maya Azucena sound and band. Becoming an independent artist was all about empowering myself. I went through this phase of waiting to be discovered, which is such a horrible feeling when you have so much inside to express, you have so much to say in the world, and you're all stopped up waiting for approval from this mysterious person or entity, you know, and once they accept you, then you get to do what you love. And I started to philosophize, like, well, I'm an artist, why would I need permission to be an artist. You know, if I'm an artist, I need to be an artist. Um, you know, forget demos, forget the, these four song audition, you know, tapes hoping someone accepts me. I, I kind of got into this notion like, really, what's between me and the people? You know, if people like what I do, then I don't need a label to get, put me together with an audience for. And I knew from the very beginning that my sound is not cookie cutter. I know that I don't sound like every other pop artist. So I knew that I'd have to do all this convincing and talk people into liking my sound. Not people, but industry. Talk them into accepting my sound, which is an alternative sound and all this. I figured, why don't I just prove that I have a market by going out there and building one. One of the first was an MTV, um, but like an international uh, show where they came and interviewed me and did a profile of my band and came to my apartment. And, uh, and that's so funny because it was in Holland that they aired this show. And then I finally went to Amsterdam to do a show and 
or it might have even been here. That's the crazy thing. Mm -hmm. Somebody who had seen the show in Holland met me in New York and was like, I saw you on MTV. <laughs> you know, it was like this really That's cool, so cool moment when you start feeling like, wow, I'm doing this and it's actually working. I just recently, you know, did a whole reality show uh, for MTV called MTV yes. Made. Let's talk about that. <laughs> MTV Made. Um, the casting director for MTV's Made, um, I guess, was seeking out artists, and I have, was referred to her by a couple of, two or three people. One that was previously a coach on MTV Made, and another is uh, the legendary guitarist, <laughs> Vernon Reed of oh. Living Color. He and I, I work. Living Color. I, I do love too. That. And um, Vernon and I, um, I'm the singer of one of his other bands. So, Did not know that. Yeah, I'm, I'm the lead singer of Yohimbi Brothers, which is a band founded by Vernon and DJ Logic. <clears throat> so Vernon um, really pushed me towards the, the, the casting director, and I, she asked me to come in. What was that like? The, was that, were you nervous? Was it like a you regular, know, uh, normal audition? Like, I don't I'll tell you, what I did like was that she didn't read up enough on me to not even call it an audition. She said, love you to come in and interview. And I liked that. Um, the other thing is, I'll be honest, like me coaching a young person is really up my alley. Mm -hmm. Like that's my, that's a no brainer for me. So I really felt like this is so what I do already. Like I, you know, I wasn't nervous really. Mm -hmm. But I came in like really like totally dressed up and you know. You were, were you wearing a suit? Dressed no, like me, ready. like dressed up the stage, like oh. artist, artist. What? And you had the lashes on? <laughs> something like that. <laughs> and it was cool because I was waiting in the lobby and their little production assistants were like, oh, I love your style. Oh, we love her style. <laughs> so then I did my interview and, um, you know, they asked me all these questions. What would you do, you know, if you were coaching a young person, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I'm totally was like, I got this. And, you know, they paired me with a young lady in Oklahoma. She's in a suburb of Oklahoma City, basically like a farm town. And she had terrible, terrible, terrible stage fright. Like, okay. like literally, like, wants to throw up and faint. But and she wanted to But she wants to sing. She, she loves okay. to sing. So you were there for just a one month? Five weeks or so. And if you can believe that, you know, five weeks to shoot one episode. So it's like a mini documentary. Right. You're there, you, you have to take the time to actually be in this person's life and help them overcome their obstacle and achieve this goal. And then they take hundreds of hours with the footage and narrow it down to a 40 minute episode. Let's talk about your whirlwind around the world self. Because you have been, I think, all over the world at least three times before, <laughs> maybe five. I've definitely been around the world in I, I, I. So, yeah. Croatia, let's talk about that, because they love you in Croatia, they love you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so, I mean, so fortunate. Um, I really have this, like, love affair with Croatia. Um, but I need to know how that happened. It started with a fan. Okay. A fan reached out and wrote me a fan letter. You read your fan now. I do. See, these are things I really believe in the power of the relationship to the people directly. Once again, like, what was the point of the middleman, you know? I, I ultimately, just to, to backtrack and say something about the industry, as my career has gotten to where it is now, where it's kind of like too much for one person to handle, I do need help. I do want a relationship with a company that respects what I do and that has more resources than I personally have. You know, at this point, it's like I've brought this big, you know, machine. Yeah, this whole big, crazy, wacky vehicle that I built. You know, I brought it this far, but I need, you know, I, I need some funding for my gas. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? So Croatia started with a fan. The fan sent me a letter and with broken English, like, I play music on my radio show. And I responded, I was like, that's so cool, man. I'd love to come to Croatia. Response, I'll see what I can do. And then in the not too far future, this person and I became email friends. And uh, he brought my CD to the number one artist in Croatia, who is like Bruce Springsteen. 
sound wise. So he's a Bruce Springsteen of popularity and sound wise. He would he's be. A rock guy? He would be what Bruce Springsteen is to New Jersey. Oh. Is what he is to Croatia. He's the number one so artist. He's too massively huge. I played with him in front of 100,000 people. Wow. Where he's the only artist on the bill. Like, he's yeah, the number like, one, number one artist in, in all of Eastern Europe is Djiboni. So this fan brought my CD to Djiboni and said, hey, listen to her. And he apparently responded and said, I love her on the song. They send me like 16 bars of the song. I don't even hear the whole song in an email with a reference. And um, I recorded all my vocals in New York City, sent them back. That song ended up winning two of their Grammys, which is called the Porter Croatian Grammy. And I was flown out there um, to open for Giboni at a corporate event. So we were out there, we rocked it, and Gibol, you know, um, checked it out. And he was like, kind of like musically, he was expecting me. And he personally asked me to come out and do an arena tour with him. So that year, not long after that, in support of that record, I came out and I did this arena tour with him. Uh, we're talking arenas and outdoor festivals, so minimum 10,000 people in the audience at every show. You have to imagine, imagine Bruce Springsteen slash like Sting or whatever, doing a show, right? That's the sound. Now, halfway through a big old concert, Mary J. Blige comes out. Yeah. Was that was the effect. So he had me where it was like now I had like maybe four song collaborations with him where mm -hmm. I would write parts in English mm -hmm. or sing the English part, whatever, and I would come out and the audience will go bananas. And I connected really with the, with the audience and started to become a thing where his audience was requesting. That's dope. And so Giovanni, when he was planning a tour, would plan to have me join him as a special surprise guest. That is so awesome. And now I've sort of adopted his fans, or his fans adopted me, and I have like this, I've been to Croatia more than 45 times. I know. New Year's, Year's, again? This last New Year's Eve was in Croatia. No, that's dope to spend New Year's Eve in a little And it was beautiful. It was so beautiful. So, since we're talking about Croatia, let's bring out that <laughs> Croatian Grammy. Do you speak the language at all? Do you da, speak learning? Da. Da? <laughs> Govrim malo. Govrim malo. Govrim malo. It's a Slavic language, so uh -huh. yes, da is present. Probably. So this is a Croatian Grammy. It's called it's the Porin. The Porin. This Porin. is the equivalent of our U.S. <laughs> Grammy. And it's amazing because I thought it was a bottle of liquor. <laughs> I thought it was some brown juice. It's really heavy. And it's really heavy, but she works out, as you can see. So <laughs> I, I tried to pick it up. I have to use two hands. But it's a beautiful, it's amazing, it's a gray. And I use it to hang my jewelry on. <laughs> yeah, you'll see. You know, but, um, you know, it's dual purpose. It, it holds beautiful jewelry. Come on, it's beautiful. Oh my gosh, you're trying to kill me. Oh my <laughs> god. It is very heavy. I couldn't imagine going to the stage and trying to do an acceptance speech holding this thing because you're so excited and you're nervous and you're probably crying. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, but yeah, it's amazing. Congratulations again on that. Thank it's you. beautiful. So, oh, and um, by the way, the fan that discovered my music and did you played it. No, actually, his name is Zap, and Zap, Zap has now become one of my really good friends, and he's my Croatian manager. Nice. <laughs> okay, she's so big time, and she has more than one manager. <laughs> so that's the thing that I like about your songs, because you always tell stories in your song. They always have a meaning, but a lot of these songs today, they just don't make any sense, or they are catchy for the club. But when you listen to the lyrics, you're like, what in the hell? are you talking about? And then Cry Love is the new project that I'm very, very proud of right now. You have some really great songs on there. And now some collaborations. Chris Robb. Tell me how you met Chris Robb. Chris Robb is my main keyboardist. Um, he is a brilliant, brilliant I can co-sign Keyboard player. Oh, he's amazing. Like, Herbie, like, don't sleep on Chris Robb. I'm telling you. I, I don't know. You have to just follow him in order to, to, to tell because you know, he's so multifaceted as a player. He's also a singer, mm -hmm. songwriter, he's an artist. He used to MD for John Legend for a little while. Um, he's played with, you know, last weekend I saw Anita him Baker. performing with Anita Baker at Radio City Hall. Uh, he and I worked together with Roberta Flack only two weekends ago. Right. He's amazing. 
So Chris Robb, I saw him when he first came to New York from Chicago playing up at a little spot in Harlem not, um, called Jimmy's Uptown. They're Jimmy's not there Uptown. anymore. Okay. I'm in the audience minding my own business and I'm like, he has got the it. You know that it thing, like not even trying? And he just has this thing that makes you like, who is he? And um, I loved his playing. And I, I basically got contacted him out of the blue and like begged him to play on the Maya Hu CD. And he came in and did these keyboard overdubs on a song. The song was called Too Much. And from then going forward, that was just my boy. Like Chris actually sang backups in my band, backup vocals. At first, before he played keys with me, he was oh. doing vocals. So tell the people about Get a Boy, how you guys did the cover. Little Get a Boy. It's a really a nice song. So tell, let's tell the people about Little Get a Street. I just, that song was nagging at me. I don't do a lot of covers, so therefore if I do cover a song, it's something that feels very meaningful to me. Little Ghetto Boy is a kind of a song that captures so much of what I'm about as a songwriter and the messaging and how I want to speak to people, how I want to touch people. Little Ghetto Boy and the Donny Hathaway, you know, version, um, you know, just kept capturing me. And I, it kept nagging at me that I wanted to do that song that we do it with Chris Rock. Like, I was very clear, and I kept saying it to him, we have to do Little Ghetto Boy as a duet. And he and I came up with an arrangement of a duet version. And um, we wrote a coda, we wrote that, that outro section, you know, Believe in Yourself. And, and it, it really just became this magical moment in a set where, you know, where one, I could feature his voice. Because Chris is so well known as a keyboardist that people don't always get to. They don't know that he can sing. They don't really know, and and also just I don't know. It's just I love that song. Oh,